In this video, we are going to try and generalize the idea of a data path and control that we saw earlier for the simple example of adding 10 numbers. It's going to be a continuation of the problem of adding 10 numbers where we will look at how we can read inputs, store outputs and generalize the type of functions that can be implemented by this data path and control. So to quickly recap where we had left off as far as adding 10 numbers sequentially was concerned. We had this architecture consisting of a single adder, its output going to a register. The upper input to the adder comes either as feedback from the register or for specific cases, that is to say when a certain counter value is equal to one, we just use a reset value, that is zero coming into the adder. The other input to the adder consists of a sequence of values x1 to x10 and one way of implementing this would be to take the values x1 to x10 feed them into a multiplexer and use a counter which counts from 1 up to 10 and then resets back to 1 to select which of these values comes through to the output of the multiplexer and therefore to the input of the adder. In this way what we have is the adder and the register essentially constitute the data path Whereas the rest of the elements, the multiplexers and the counter, even though we do not have an explicit finite state machine in this case, the counter sort of implements something like a finite state machine. Those components constitute the control logic. What happens when we want to generalize this to n numbers? We could just change the counter. Instead of counting from 1 up to 10, it can count from 1 up to n. And in turn, the multiplexer that selects which input goes through to the adder needs to now select from one number n numbers instead of one out of 10 numbers. That's all the change that we really need to make. Now, one thing that we should probably pay attention to over here is rather than having these, all of the input numbers being sent into a multiplexer and then being selected out, is there a better way of doing this? We have already looked at the idea of a memory array where we can store a set of registers, store values in a set of registers, and by giving some kind of a read address, we can select which of those values is to come out. Behaviorally, this is exactly the same as the multiplexer that we have shown earlier. It's just that from a structural implementation point of view, the multiplexer is now absorbed into this memory array, and we can therefore concentrate on just getting the rest of the functionality right. All that we need to do is to provide a read address to this memory array. That read address in this case, of course, is the counter value itself. Now what happens if we try to change the set of operations that we are interested in? Rather than adding 10 numbers, what if we want to do a more general kind of computation? Let's say a Taylor series expansion. Or in particular, we just have to compute a value which is given by f of x equals 1 plus x plus x by 2 plus x squared by 6 plus x cubed by 24. We stop there. It's a finite computation. It's not an infinite series that we are interested in right now. What are the kinds of operations that we have over here? There is addition, multiplication and division. Now if we look closely at this, we need to sort of think of how do we break this down into smaller operations that could actually get implemented on hardware and we need to provide some kind of storage for x and various other intermediate values that are being computed in this process. One thing we can do is to take the equation that we have and break it up into a sequence of operations as shown over here, where we essentially introduce several new variables. t1 is equal to one plus x, t2 is equal to x by two, t3 is equal to t1 plus t2. These values t1, t2, t3, etc we are not specifying what they are or where they are stored. We know that we need to provide some kind of storage for them. But apart from that, we are not really interested in how they are implemented. In particular, you would notice that I have not really bothered to try and optimize and try to reuse variables. So don't think of these as necessarily variables in a program. That comes later. For the time being, all that we are interested in is can this be done at all, irrespective of the number of intermediate variables that I need to introduce. So in this way, we can basically break up the entire computation of f of x into nine such operations. 
each operation as either an addition or a division or a multiplication. So now let's look at how we can generalize the data path that we worked with earlier. We had an adder, but now let's try and extend it to an arithmetic unit that's capable of doing addition, multiplication, and division. And addition and subtraction are sufficiently close operations in complexity that we might as well throw in subtraction as well. We need to set some specifications. And what we are going to do is to say that we can accept only two values as inputs. And in addition to this, we will also accept one operation, which is the op code, which tells us whether we need to do add, subtract, multiply, or divide. At each stage, this arithmetic unit will now generate a single output. The questions that we need to answer are, where will the inputs come from? Where do the outputs go to? And ultimately, what we'll be doing is using some kind of registers in order to store all of that. So now let's look at this as a possible architecture. The arithmetic unit shown on the right takes the in1 and in2 as the two inputs. It also needs to, of course, get an op code, which tells us what exactly needs to be done. In addition to that, we have the t1, t2, all storage. And this entire structure that we have over here is some kind of a set of registers into which I can write values or from which I can read values. So the read address one and read address two are some values that need to be provided from somewhere, which will basically tell us which of these variables or which of these values need to come out as the in one and in two inputs to the arithmetic unit. Now the question becomes, how do we get the sequence of operations? As you can see over here in the previous page, we have, for example, T1 is equal to one plus X. So we know that one and X, need to be provided as the inputs. The next time we have x and two to be given, then comes t1 and t2, x and x and so on. Each of those, we'll assume that even the values like one, two, 24 and so on are stored somewhere in this register file. And in such a situation, what I will need to do is basically I can provide the read address one and read address two in sequence to them. Now, I can't just make sure that I always have the t1, t2, etc. stored always in sequence. And the next question that will come is, so what happens if read address one is equal to read address two? For example, when I want to use X into X, I need to get the same value out twice. So clearly read address one cannot just be fed from a counter. But what I can do is to take another array of registers, store the index for the operations into that array, and I call it op one. And similarly, the op two addresses will store the indexes for the second input. I use a counter which now goes 1, 2, 3, 4 up to n where I have some n which is basically the number of operations I'm going to perform. For each of those values it pulls out a corresponding address, sends that to this register array and from the register array appropriate values come out as in1 and in2. I can now add control to this which means that I can take the output of this arithmetic unit and feed it back and the same counter can now be used to feed in the output addresses which basically tell me whatever value came back from the arithmetic unit into which location in this register array should they get fed. Apart from all this of course the one other thing that is needed is the actual operations themselves and this could also be fed in exactly the same way. I have the counter which drives the ops array, which in turn stores the sequence of operations. The first one would be plus, next would be divide, next would again be plus and so on. So in this way, what we have constructed is a more complicated data path, which essentially corresponds to this arithmetic unit plus the register array. And in addition to that, all the blue boxes over here show us that we have various different arrays within which we are storing the control logic. So op1 and op2 store the addresses from which to get the inputs. Output address array stores the addresses where the outputs of each operation need to get stored and the ops array stores the corresponding operation itself. 
Now you'll realize that there was no real need to have four different memory arrays over here because they are after all all being fed or driven by the same counter which means that I could have taken the values in op1, op2, ops and output and put them all together into a single wide array, read them out at one shot based on the address determined by counter and then split up those bits in order to control the different parts of my circuit. Some part of it goes to the read address one, some part goes to read address two, some part goes to the output address and some part goes to ops. Effectively, in other words, we have created a primitive form of an instruction. So to summarize, the core data path just concentrates on pure numerical computation. It's mostly just a combinational unit. In addition to that, of course, we have a register array, which is some kind of storage. It does not perform any control by itself, but just provides the mechanism whereby I can write the values that I'm computing and also read them out later if necessary. The rest of the logic and the kind of computation that is done is done in our case by means of a very simple finite state machine, which is basically a counter feeding into an array consisting of a set of so-called operation codes. On every clock cycle, one value is read out from that array, some operation is performed, and the output is returned to an appropriate register all determined by the value stored in the memory location. So we can see that the addition of memory for storing the operations has essentially increased the state space of the system. Normally what we would have is we would just have a finite state machine that is capable of responding to any particular input that it sees. Over here we are effectively creating state uh, many more states than what we had initially by means of saying that all the memory locations used for the instructions constitute part of the state space of the system. The more bits that we allocate to this, it means that the number of possible states of the system is increasing exponentially. More importantly, this idea of the memory where we store the operations and the addresses is generalized to the idea of a Turing machine and corresponds to the concept of the tape that is used in the discussion of Turing machines. A detailed discussion of Turing machines is well outside the scope of this course, although it is definitely something that you should refer to if you are interested in that, in understanding the basics of computability and of what it means to be able to compute any kind of function. For now, what we have is a system that is capable of generalizing the idea of an operation beyond simple addition, storing those operations into some location and responding to those requests as required by reading them out in sequence and processing them one by one.